There we go. Uh, we are going to be covering some uh, content that, um, you know, kind of goes against the, the grain, pardon the pun, pun intended, maybe. Um, I was thinking, Craig, this is a, definitely a good one to be doing virtually. Yeah, so we don't uh, get thrown at us? Yeah, exactly. We don't get egged. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what, and the, and the reality is, is that more and more people are becoming, um, there's an awareness for sure. I mean, you see a lot more people saying, oh, no, I try to stay away from gluten, or no, I try to stay away from grains, or, um, uh, you know, it, questionably whether or not there's a lot more people in the population that are extremely, you know, in, the, in that celiac kind of um, um, mm. you know, micropopulation. But I think mm -hmm. that as we go through this, we're going to talk a little bit more about grains and kind of their effect on our health. But I think that kind of brings me to my first couple of questions is really, I think we can all agree that what we eat has a fairly uh, significant direct effect on our health, right? Um, you know, you can notice the difference between how energized you feel when you eat the burger and fries versus when you have mm -hmm. a nice salad with some uh, some good quality protein in it, right? Um, you know, and a lot of us, actually, whenever I do this workshop, I've asked people, like, how do you know, how many of you know exactly what to eat to optimize your health? And hands start to go down a bit because some people are not quite sure what they should be doing. And, and that's kind of the whole purpose of doing these workshops and these webinars is to help people guide them because we've done a lot of the legwork in terms of helping sift through the mountains and mountains of information that are out there so that we can help you to direct you into some good choices that are just going to get you springboarded into some action, which will then allow you to take some uh, initial steps to start moving in that right direction. We always talk about a continuum of health, and we just want to make sure that you're moving in the right direction, and that comes down to some of those choices that we make on a daily basis. So we know that what we eat has a direct effect on our health, and we know that um, what we eat can optimize our health. And the next thing is, does what we eat actually match what we think about and what we know to be true in terms of how eating affects our health? And that's kind of the knowing doing gap. And that's where we start to fall into this space where maybe some of the actions that we take are not in alignment with our belief systems. And that kind of brings us back to what we did last month in the Think by Design series and the whole purpose of that is to get you to start to think about aligning your belief systems, what you understand to be true with your actions. Because some, to be truthful, your behavior never lies. The things that you do on a daily basis is a true perfect reflection of what your actual belief system is. So when we go back to looking at our belief systems and then our actions, the things that we do. So let's say that health is a high importance and priority for me, but yet I don't want to exercise and I don't eat well, but I say, oh, it's really important to be healthy, kids. You know, you should really, you should really, help. being healthy is one of the most important things you can do in your world, but you yourself are not exercising and showing the kids that or not eating properly and scolding them for some of the choices and foods that they do, but you yourself are making some of those poor choices. You know what I mean? That starts to create a disconnect and the gap, right? And then, of course, the results. And so we talk about those in terms of when we look at ourselves, do we actually reflect the image of what our belief system is? Because then if we say that we are health is a priority and eating well is important and exercise and all those things, then we have to ask ourselves, are we happy with those results that we call into question? So things like our body composition or energy level, what's our digestion like? Is our skin quality good? Are our moods kind of fluctuate? If any of you have ever seen changes in your moods just after eating certain foods, um, that's a pretty good indicator and predictor that you may not be, uh, you may have some sensitivity to those foods or you just may not, those foods may not be right for you. Um, your mental awareness, your sleep quality, your athletic performance, how well do you recover? How well do you uh, perform when you actually do your events and your activities? And that can be anything from being a, young youthful soccer player to being uh, just a gym warrior right so any of that how well do you recover how well do your tissues feel after you um, you exercise etc those chronic aches and pains are you excessively sore post-workout 
Um, you maybe struggle with, wait, I've been going to the gym and I'm going for a year and I walk on the treadmill and I do all the things, but I haven't lost an ounce. Um, those are some things that we need to dive into a little bit and start to look at actions, results, and our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And those really kind of shape from what we talk about within Life by Design and in all of these workshops, Eat by Design, Move by Design, Think by Design, we got to go back to looking at, okay, what are the essential requirements? That's where we're going to start to kind of make a foundation here. We're going to build, um, you know, we're going to build this up and we're going to start with a solid foundation that gives us an understanding because then we can start to look at some of those nuances, right? Um, and individual desires, likes, dislikes, et cetera, when it comes to food and textures and quality and all those kinds of things. But the foundation is paramount to make sure that you've got the bases covered, okay? So in our world, in our health, there are essential requirements for us to express health. And if we don't provide them in abundance with purity, we don't express health, we express, express symptoms, sickness, and disease. So you see my plan, this is a good analogy uh, for this example. When we think of a wilting plant, um, some of the things that we think the plant needs are water, sunlight, and good soil, right? Three essential requirements that a plant needs to be as healthy as it possibly can. So this flower here we can see is wilting um, and not getting something. We don't know what that is at this point. But if you translate that into our health, you look at, okay, what are the essential requirements that our bodies need in order to express health and that is to eat move and think in ways that are congruent within our genetic makeup within our lifestyle uh, design that we actually start to build and we have to provide it in its essential uh, elements so that that way we can start to create vibrancy and health and thrive within our world okay so as we go through today, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the specific things with regards to grains. And, and that is going to be a challenge because we've kind of always been told, I mean, I was a grain junkie when I was a kid. I mean, if you looked at my old uh, uh, grocery list, <laughs> bagels, <laughs> Nestle, Nesquik, or whatever that chocolate powder is that you put in, big bag of milk, uh, McCain Deep and Delicious cake, um, you know, I was a grain sugar junkie. So, um, and lo and behold, I was chronically sick with sinus problems and sinus infections and bronchitis and you name it from the ages of 16 to 20. I was chronically, chronically sick. So, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about grains. We're going to talk a whole bunch about kind of some of the, we're going to go against the, you know, the, the grain, we'll say, <laughs> <laughs> um, a little bit of a sandpaper kind of uh, feel to some of this, but what we're going to ask you to do is to kind of open up a little bit and listen to some of the things that we're, Dr. John's going to mention here with regards to some of the research and the science that is out there with regards to grains. And it's not, um, you can probably uh, explain this a little bit better. It's not so much that grains in and of themselves are bad. It's that the bodies are not yet ready for them and adapted for it and mm -hmm. that's a bigger issue that nobody wants to um or uh, that we want to expose you we want to let you know about yeah yeah that's uh that's a great jumping off point uh craig because the the react like well I'll, I'll give you a, a one minute backstory for me is uh you know i was raised vegetarian and uh certainly when i got into my like teens and then, you know, when I moved away from home and I was, uh, you know, in university, like my, I, my diet was essentially made up of like grains. And I did eat quite a bit of whole foods, vegetables and fruit as well, but, you know, lots of pastas, rice, bread, um, uh, you know, soy, I ate a lot of tofu. Um, and uh, I, I just, I fully bought into this belief system around grains are good for you. Um, they're a health food. Uh, these are beliefs that we were, you know, all of us have been, uh, in, I, I would now describe as indoctrinated, but it, basically we were uh, steeped in this uh, set of beliefs around grains being a health food. Um, and so everything that we're, I'm going to talk about in the next 15 minutes uh, was shocking to me when I learned it and I resisted for a long time. And so if you get that feeling of like, Ugh, uh, you know, I kind of want to re reach through the uh, camera and give me a, a strangle, <laughs> tell me to stop. 
um, or if you re just resist the information, like that's normal, okay? Because I'm going to push back against some of these like really deeply ingrained <laughs> um, uh, beliefs that uh, um, we've just been uh, uh, we've been taught this over and over and over again, um, all the way from uh, infancy, all the way through school, and so. Um, John, I and, and I'd like to just kind of preface all of this by saying um, I, for one, am not a hundred percent grain free. Like I, they do sneak into my diet at times and I do notice the difference in my own body performance when mm -hmm. I take them in. So for instance, last uh, fall, somebody made me a sourdough and brought it into me and man, oh man, I devoured that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And truth be told, it's pretty addictive and it's pretty tasty. However, my body did not like it at all. And it's almost to the point now where since I've been away from it for so, you know, most of the time, uh, when it does creep mm -hmm. back in, my digestion shuts right down. I start, like, it just, it creates a myriad of things for me, but mental fog, sleep gets disturbed. Um, there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of, so I want everybody to know, like, you know, we're this not perfect. is kind of a, one of those things. It's like um, we're trying to minimize this effect. So that's right. Yeah, and and, and what Craig just described is is really common for, uh, and I, I've experienced that also. Um, and it's uh, it can be a little bit frustrating because, like you know, said you mentioned sourdough bread. Like I love sourdough bread. You know, if I could eat it every day, I'd be super happy. Um, but uh, at the same time, I'm not willing to do it given the cost that I can now feel. Uh, and that's actually a, a little prelude of the, the kind of action steps at the end of this is, is just to test and, and you know, cut them out for 30 days to see how your body responds uh, and then reintroduce them and see what happens. And uh, that's really the best way to, to kind of prove to yourself whether they are um, harmful or not. So, um, but uh, I, I did want to jump off of, uh, Craig, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about, um, you know, just, uh, we haven't adapted. We're just not um, uh, like grains themselves aren't bad. It's like in themselves, like they, they are literally just part of a plant. Um, but one of the things you have to, uh, this was actually blew my mind when I first heard it. And, uh, uh, and since then it's changed completely the way I think about plants. Cause if, um, you know, we've been co-evolving with plants for hundreds of millions of years. So I don't know. Um, as uh, pre-humans, uh, but certainly plants have been evolving themselves, right? And uh, while animals have evolved to get, um, you know, my, uh, better and better adapted to their environment, meaning, you know, for humans, like we can walk long distances, we can climb, we can crawl, we can um, carry, we can, you know, we have this incredible mind, um, all that, all those advantages that we've created have come through evolution. Um, plants, they can't move, right? They have no way of, uh, uh, protecting themselves physically, uh, but what they've done is they've actually evolved some really uh, impressive um, protective mechanisms that uh, get, uh, come packaged with the, the plant itself. So either in the leaves, the bark, the roots, um, and those uh, molecules are, you know, these plants have evolved them to make sure that that plant can survive and procreate, right? That's the ultimately the goal of evolution is just to make babies and plants do that in the form of their seeds. Um, and so when it comes to the actual, um, these plants, they've evolved ways of making sure that they um, don't get eaten or if they get eaten, that the animal <clears throat> is, uh, is harmed in some way, right? So they don't go back. Um, and so that's actually the, um, I think a good place to kind of start from is that plants themselves, although they're not bad in themselves, they just, they don't do well for humans. Um, we actually, it's only been, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand years um, that, uh, you know, as, as uh, homo sapiens, but there's been millions of years like of, of pre-humans um, where we've been eating and exposed to animal foods. Um, but grains themselves really only showed up about 10,000 years ago. So the, the timelines are, uh, there's a pretty vast difference there and, and uh, our bodies are simply just much better adapted to like an animal-based um, uh, uh, diet. Um, not saying that we only eat animals, but uh, uh, we've just been exposed to this much longer so our body's better adapted. Whereas wheat uh, and particularly grains, um, 
or grains more generally. We just haven't been exposed to them for that long. Uh, even though 10,000 years sounds like a long time, it's really not that long uh, when you consider evolution. So, uh, and the other thing is that we just haven't, our bodies haven't been, been able to figure out a way of eating them without um, being harmed. Uh, so we haven't, um, you know, perhaps in another 10,000 years, we would get to that point. Uh, but uh, so far, that doesn't seem to have happened. And so I'll, I'll, I'll get into that, like, so the, the, the details of like what it does to the gut in a, in a moment here. But really, step one is, um, and the case against grains is that we're just not adapted to grains yet. Um, and uh, number two is actually when you look at what you eat when you uh, eat grains, um, the nutrient density, like that's actually, you know, fundamental to building a healthy diet is figuring out, okay, well, what's the no, most nutrient dense foods? Um, and grains just don't really stack up when you compare them against pretty much any other food type, uh, vegetable, fruit, or um, meat. And um, we know this when, you know, because basically you can analyze a food and break it down in terms of the actual nutrient content. So this is just um, like a, a nutrient density scale. Uh, so these numbers don't really mean anything to us, but apart from just showing where, um, you know, grains are way in the negative, um, whereas we get uh, uh, the highest end is uh, organ meat, actually, that's the most nutrient dense um, foods that we can get. So that's just something that, you know, even, even if grain didn't cause us harm, uh, you know, as compared to pretty much any other food that especially now we get exposed to every day from, you know, we have such easy access to food, um, it just doesn't match up at all. It's not in the same ballpark when it comes to the amount of nutrients. And I, and I, that's, Probably maybe hard to swallow because we've been exposed to all this marketing that shows us, like that pitches grains and grain based foods as filled with nutrients like that they're excuse me really like a healthy food um but that's just it simply isn't the case it's the facts that right. add up there. on that note it's like one of the strongest arguments against um some of the food guides uh has been the lobbying by the grain farmers and mm -hmm. the milk industry to create a higher priority on some of these products that have shaped the de development of these food guides, which is yeah. what we're all, which we, I was raised with and, and school is taught, right? The largest portion of your triangle was going to be your grains. So, yep. Yeah. It was, or, yeah, it's the base of the base of the pyramid. Yeah. And, uh, and, and yeah, Craig's right. It actually comes out of like, the, not to, don't tell too far here, but it, it that comes from really good intentions because post World War II, North America was mm -hmm. um, considering that, man, we're going to have to be able to feed the world. Like the Europe is destroyed, um, we really we need to step up our game and, and provide enough calories to the uh, the, the redeveloping world. You know, the, the, to, in Europe and then also the developing world in um, Africa, China, India. So um, grains that happen to be a really good. Um, food that could be stored, could be transported, um, and it was, you know, relatively dense in calories. Um, and so it, you know, really well-intentioned people were like, man, if we have to feed the whole world, we better find the, the most efficient way to get calories to the most people, uh, and grains filled that. And then that kind of set the foundation for then, um, you know, as Craig said, lots of lobbying and, and the, the actual food industry um, uh, spends more on lobbying than any other industry. Um, uh, so that just says something about like, okay, we may not always be getting the, <laughs> the, the, the facts as consumers. Uh, and that's the thing is that like it, the point, and we're not trying to be a conspiracy theory thing here. It's, it's more just, if we look at the actual research of what it is they do for us versus what they don't, mm -hmm. you will see a discrepancy between what a nutritionist will tell you and what a dietitian will tell you. And the reason mm -hmm. why is because a lot of the education system is based in a dietitian world, is based on the food guides and mm -hmm. the industry uh, influence. A nutritionist will look at the whole body of evidence with regards to our evolutionary pro uh, developments and how it influences our, our health and our gut and GI, and, like the whole thing. So um, mm -hmm. Different educational sources, and this is kind of that it is a bit of a frustrating gap for a lot of practice members because they'll come in like, Well, you know, I heard this one thing and then I heard the other. And so, what we're going to mm -hmm. recommend is just look at the requirements, go back to your fundamental basis. What does the body require? And then, if we look at the grand scheme of kind of what our um, uh, genetic makeup has been developed over millions of years, 
then we can start to look at what is most important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that's where, you know, EPA design is based on that, uh, you know, nutrient density is the priority, is the primary um, metric. That's the, the thing to look at when you're considering food, uh, from our perspective. Um, and uh, so, you know, choosing foods that have, have the highest nutrient density and then the lowest toxicity. So those two questions that we're always asking um, to, uh, in the EPA design framework is, is it high nutrient density and is it low toxicity? So when we talk about, the, in both those cases, um, grains really um, loses out. Um, and number three actually is uh, uh, um, that grains are addictive. So uh, there's this really interesting um, uh, neurochemistry that happens. So when we eat grains, there's elements of the grain that actually, you know, go through the gut, come up through the bloodstream, cross the blood-brain barrier and trigger the same sensors in your brain that say like cocaine would, okay, or other um, similar drugs. Uh, and, and it, it, creates or it, um, it uh, drives this loop of addiction. So if everyone has tried to cut out grains, particularly bread, bread and pastas, um, like the highly processed um, grains and wheat, that it's really tough, right? And some people actually go through uh, an actual detoxification. It's similar to what you'd experience and not as extreme as alcoholism, but um, you know, you might get, feel like you've got the flu, you might have a couple of days where you're kind of, you're sweating, you're you might have diarrhea, like there's um, that evidence that the body is just working, it's <laughs> having to process the, uh, this, this, uh, like the, uh, the effects of this addictive substance. Um, and it's, I mean, just, it, we talked about sourdough bread, like, man, if there's a loaf of uh, bread in my house, it's like, <laughs> between Viv and I, it, it doesn't last, you know, more than a day, <laughs> um, because it just is so, uh, so good. Um, number four is that processed grains actually just is sugar. So the, if we look at, um, you know, the amount of processed foods that we eat, and probably the people on this call, like you, you probably don't, you, you know, um, you're showing up to a nutrition uh, workshop, you're probably trying to eat healthy and getting whole foods in. Uh, but the reality is about 60% of, uh, uh, like in, in Canada, about 60% of the calories consumed are uh, processed. Um, and most of those are grains. So we got the, the top four is wheat, or, or um, wheat varieties, uh, soy, uh, corn and uh those are the top three i'm, I'm blanking on the fourth one uh and so you know and most of our calories are coming from those those three plants uh, those three grains um, and ultimately they all get broken down into sugar so uh sugar is, uh, has a it's actually quite toxic in the bloodstream and so our body has these all these mechanisms to reduce sugar um and uh insulin being one of those so that we know that uh, there's a, a pretty strong relationship between how much processed food meaning processed grains we eat uh, and the amount of uh, like uh, evidence of diabetes and uh, effects of having high sugar in the diet um uh, just an example uh it just this blows my mind but from a a, uh, a great book called wheat belly um where uh, the author actually demonstrated the effects on the uh our, our liver like our ability to process the sugar this it's really the same has the same impact um two pieces of you know health or heart healthy whole wheat bread um, has the same impact as a mars bar and that is uh you know quite shocking right because we think of them like they're, they're in totally different categories one's healthy one's unhealthy one's you know a cheap food one's a you know something that you want to eat every day but in reality they have a similar impact on the body um and that is just uh so just the effects of the sugar. Um, and then the last one, it, this, uh, uh, it, it kind of fits back with the, what I started out with and in terms of how plants evolve these ways of making sure that they, uh, their seeds can get to ground and, and grow, um, is that there's uh, harmful elements to the, to the seeds. Also, actually, I'm, I'm learning a bit more about the harmful elements in like leaves uh, and also roots, um, but we'll stick to just the grains. Um, particularly in like the lining of the grain, there's these harmful proteins that uh, are, uh, you know, they just, they literally damage the gut similar to, uh, you know, if you just imagine scratching skin over and over again, you know, like one pass, not a big deal, but after five passes, you know, you might get some redness. And then, um, if you keep scratching that same area, it's going to start to, um, you know, maybe uh, open up a bit. You might get some bleeding, you might get some, uh, or just some pus. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, and, and once the, skin is broken, then, you know, there's more risk of like things getting in from the outside, right? So you'd be concerned about bacteria and that kind of stuff. The, 
inside our gut, these proteins kind of do a similar thing, but on a microscopic level. And they can um, start to, the long story short is that they can start to create, um, you know, holes in the gut uh, that allow things in that aren't supposed to get in. And, uh, and then that, there's a whole bunch of uh, there's like a cascade of events that happen after that that just make it really, uh, this is where like a lot of bloating comes from, um, the uh, inflammatory um, conditions, and chronic inflammation, which sits at the bottom of all, you know, the basis of all chronic health problems. Um, there does seem to be a strong relationship between like what's going on in the gut, so the health of the gut um, in terms of the, uh, how much inflammation and uh, our overall health, and in particular, um, things like autoimmune conditions, um, heart disease, diabetes, these all have a, a link back to the health of the gut. So, um, so that's actually, you know, the, the gluten would be the, the poster child of those harmful proteins. Um, that's the one we hear most about, right? The challenge against wheat. Um, I, I see that it's obviously the major challenge, but it's uh, the first four, um, I think, that we talked about um, are actually even more powerful than that. Uh, simply um, cutting it out because it has gluten in it. Um, there's uh, lots of other reasons why cutting out grains is just simply a, a good choice um, if you want to kind of optimize your health. Mm -hmm. um, so we, uh, just to get into the action steps here in the last couple of minutes, um, as, as Dr. Craig mentioned, like, you know, we're both, uh, this is something that we, and I would say a lot of people um, struggle with the most in terms of eBuy design is this, uh, you know, the step of trying to reduce or remove grains. Um, and there's, there's kind of two approaches. You could do the all or nothing, right? Or they said the all in, I should say, do the all in and just like say, okay, 30 days, I'm just going to cut it all out. Um, that's, uh, I think probably the, that would be the fastest way to get results and, and to really test and see um, the effects of uh, grains on your gut and on your health. Um, it's really hard. So the other option is to do kind of like the 80-20, like, okay, can I cut out, um, you know, even let's say 50%, start there, or you know what, I'm not even going to set a percentage, just start somewhere. Take, uh, you know, if you um, are eating bread every day, maybe take it out one meal. Um, there's, uh, you can do it in a graded fashion like that, so that, uh, you know, as you prove to yourself, like, oh, no, I can get away with, uh, you know, I feel fine without it, uh, consuming that food um, in the mornings, let's say, then, uh, you know, kind of build some confidence and that will ha help to give you a, uh, be able to make uh, further and further kind of changes to your diet. So um, Craig, I don't know if you have anything, uh, any strategy uh, to share there. Yeah, like uh, you can use a lot, um, like lettuce wraps go a long way for using if you're a big sandwich person. Uh, my wife and I, uh, like I'll admit, I love burgers. Um, so what we try to do to cut out the grain is we'll actually use a portobello mushroom cap. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll grill those on the barbecue and then we can put the burger open faced on a, you know, a bed of lettuce on the, the mushroom cap. Um, there is, um, uh, you know, just looking at other solutions instead of the grains is um, you, know, you can replace vegetables with most everything. You can make a pasta noodle out of spiralized zucchini and carrot mm -hmm. and, and squash, and you can do wonderful things that way. Uh, we'll mm -hmm. make uh, open-faced uh, spaghetti squash bowls. So we'll just cut a spaghetti squash down the middle, uh, open it up, or put it face down, excuse me, and then put it in the oven, cook it for 30 minutes, take it out scrape it all up with a fork, throw a meat tomato sauce on top of it. And um, yeah, it's, it, it still gives you that same kind of, you know, great spaghetti kind of feeling like you're still, uh, you, you're getting, you know, something like that, but it's just, it's delicious. And you feel so much more energized after you don't feel like heavy and sluggish and, and weighted down. Um, there's many other alternatives. I would, I it would always try to encourage people, you know, you're better to, some of the gluten-free products are a little bit harder on you because they use different, um, uh, they might use like other kind of starches like potato or um, mm -hmm. different things that just don't agree with the GI tract too much. Um, but like if you're making a plate and a, and a pasta, we always, or I'm sorry, a plate, not a pasta, a plate, you're making, where's the meat, where's the fat, where's the protein? Or, mm -hmm. 
Where's the vegetable? <laughs> Where's the vegetable? Where's the veggie? <laughs> Where's the meat? Where's the fat? So yeah. you, know, you might make a plate where you got two thirds of your plate is a salad. You've got a four or five ounce piece of uh, you know, red meat or chicken or turkey or something. And then maybe you got some sliced avocado or you know, a couple of handful of, uh, of mixed nuts um, with some <laughs> seeds. Seeds are a wonderful source of vitamin B. Um, so for all you vitamin B strugglers, uh, that's a great way to get a lot of B vitamins that help with your energy. Uh, also aids in uh, absorption of things like iron and other elements. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, those are just some, some typical ways that we do things. And I mean, we, you know, a typical plate for us in breakfast might be some eggs, some avocado, uh, maybe a bit of bacon, and you can even make a hash out of sweet potato and some kale, a little bit of olive mm -hmm. oil, a little bit of onion, maybe a tiny, tiny bit of garlic, salt and pepper, kind of cook that up into a skillet and just uh, serve that with your side of eggs. It's it's wonderful. So, yeah, that sounds, sounds amazing. I just got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't eaten lunch. Um, yeah, I think just, uh, you can, in tacos, terms of you can make general, little, little tacos just out of iceberg lettuce and put your meat and stuff in there and just have that. Yeah. All the, have all the same sauces and yeah. yeah I, the, uh, one thing we talk about with, uh, eating vegetables is, um, you know, repl uh, replacing grains with vegetables. Um, there's lots of things you can, as Craig was describing, to, to supplement. Um, and, and also, I think just, you know, getting a bit adventurous and testing out, trying new uh, vegetables. I'm looking at this picture and just kind of thinking back, I, like it was only a couple of years ago, that one in the middle, the, it's a celery act. Um, I'd never, like, thought to buy that before. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of scary. <laughs> I wasn't really sure what it was, how to prepare it. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I just thought, oh, what the heck, I'll just buy one and try it. And, you know, it's like this delicious uh, vegetable that I'd like. And now it's like in my, I wouldn't say regular rotation, but, it, you know, maybe once a month I'll buy one. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun to just explore and get the kids involved, you know, at the, right now at the markets, it's awesome, you know, to go and actually get them to uh, pick out um, some of the food so that they're excited and, um, you know, taste the difference between like a food that's grown and picked uh, you know, the day before you're eating it versus what we get in the grocery store. And, um, you know, I, I think there's, uh, uh, especially right now, there's lots to get excited about when it comes to vegetables. So it's a great time to do this test, right? Of if you wanted to go all in and just reduce, remove uh, grains from your diet and just, you know, eat, eat more vegetables. The fall is a wonderful time for that. Like it's, there's such an abundance of vegetables coming out of the farms right now. It's, it's going to be mm -hmm. amazing for the next three months. So this is a terrific yeah. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I don't see any questions. Uh, if anybody has questions, feel free to uh, put those in the chat box. One thing I was going to mention too is like with um, uh, wheat, for instance, I, I was fortunate to have lunch and spend about five hours with uh, Bill Davis, the um, uh, author of Wheat Belly. And we had a really good chat. And he kind of explained to me, you know, the genetic modification of grain, especially wheat in North America, has just been rampant. And it's for all the things that you talked about, you know, they've, they've created a grain now that is so diametrically opposed to kind of how its foundational elements are like normal wheat should grow almost four to four and a half feet tall. Um, but because it's very vulnerable to winds and rain and heavy, like just environmental factors, when it lays down, that's it, it's done, it rusts and it rots. And so um, what they did is they developed one that has a sturdier, thicker stalk stem and has uh, maybe about two, two and a half feet tall so that it can withstand the wind uh, and change that way. Um, and in doing so though, that also started to uh, change the way in which those proteins are that are on the inside. Because again, if they can create greater yields, they can grow in an acre, they can gain so much more uh, amount of a product simply in a smaller area. So they, they mm. modified that and then they modified it too to make it insect resistant. Um, and so he said, you know, the problem is so much that a lot of the grains that we get here in North America have been so modified that it's hard for us to get much of the benefit out of it. And he's like, I've actually had patients tell me who are celiac who have been able to ingest flowers imported from Europe simply because 
um, it's not modified and it doesn't have the same negative effects because those big proteins, your, your nervous system and your immune system go into attack mode when they realize there's these big foreign proteins inside the system, that's what triggers an immune response. So all that to say is that, um, yeah, it, it's, it's better to try to avoid a lot of these things. And, and like here's a, a, a cardiologist who started taking his patients off of all grains and saw dramatic drops in their blood pressure, their, their cholesterol, their triglycerides. That's the only change he made to their, their things, uh, to their dietary intake. And within 90 days, he was seeing massive changes within their blood lipid profiles that changed the way in which he practices medicine now. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, that's uh... There, there's so many case studies, you know, like literally like yeah, hundreds of thousands of <laughs> case studies now uh, of people that, you know, when they take this step, their all manner of health problems um, improve. And it's, yeah, it's, as Dr. Craig said, it's the, when we remove the, the substance that causes inflammation, then um, at least it's one factor that we can uh, uh, kind of, we can pull the lever on, you know, like we we can actually make that choice to, to cut it out and, and, and then reap the benefits. Okay. So next week we're going to kind of, what are we going to do, John? We're going to tie everything together. Yeah, we're going to do uh, uh, so a, a review and, and basically we're looking at uh, kind of what are the top um, frequently asked questions and uh, how do we, how do we start eat? to implement this? Yeah. How do we, how do we make this happen? How do we pull this together? How do I get my kids on board? How do I get my husband on board? How do I, get my my wife on board how do i like all of those questions we're going to talk a little bit about how we can pull it all together so if you have any questions please uh email us um and we'll make sure that they get on the list so we uh address them next week perfect have a wonderful week everyone thanks for joining us awesome. you'll uh, get the replay here and uh next week we will be sending out the eat by design manual yes that's right okay awesome Thank have a wonderful you. day Okay, thanks guys. Have a good day. See you, bye.